So, let's see if this works. Okay, thanks, <laughs> and uh, welcome to, to my little talk on uh, data, actually, which I think is quite important and has popped up in a couple of uh, the other talks as well. So I guess we're all familiar with the deep learning revolution and uh, we're all aware that it's relevant and it's important to solve the problems that we care about most. Um, but what is the problem with this? Well, the problem is that most of the success that we've seen so far is really in the supervised domain, right? There's really relatively little unsupervised that works uh, that well that you could deploy it. And so the question is, how do we get the data here, right? And it means not, you know, in a supervised case with these high capacity models, not to just gather a little data, but to gather, gather a lot of data. And not just a lot of data, but a lots and lots of data. <laughs> I really like this slide. <laughs> um, so, uh, and it's not just data, right? Um, we need to have annotated data, so we also need labels. And we do not just need a few labels, but uh, you see where this is going. Uh, we need a lot of labels. And for this, we need money, right? and uh, we need a lot of money. So, um, for some tasks, this is actually quite doable, right? If you want to do image classification, um, well, okay, classifying into 1,000 classes might not be an easy task, but we managed to do so, and, and tagging an image with a single class label is something that takes relatively modest time, so if, the, if you have the money, you can actually do. Um, it becomes a bit more complicated if you want to do semantic segmentation because you need to now uh, annotate every pixel with a semantic or an instance class label, right? So that takes about 90 minutes per image for the cityscapes data set that you can see here. But okay, if you have the money, still you can do it. You can get these uh, decent size uh, data sets now, even much bigger than the cityscapes data set we've seen before with the uh, Vistas, Mapillary Vistas data set. So how can you do that? Well, you can go to Mechanical Turk and get your data labeled there, but everyone who has worked with Mechanical Turk probably has realized that the quality you get and the quality assurance you need to do is, is at a level that, uh, you know, or speaking otherwise, um, the deep learning algorithms are at a level that are already rivaling uh, the performance of the Mechanical Turkers. So um, it's really difficult to get the quality that's actually needed to improve uh, from the state where we're at. And, uh, this led to the development of a whole annotation uh, industry, actually. So the big, uh, well, this is just a few of them, of course, but uh, big companies all have their annotation labs. Um, but then there's also a couple of startups that actually exploit this, where you can get your data labeled as a service, right? So if you have the, da if you have the money, you can actually get your data labeled to a reasonable extent. But what about other tasks, for instance, optical flow? It's really difficult for a human to find correspondences. It's not some a task that you really want to put a human to do. Um, and there's also no ground truth sensor for optical flow, right? So some, for some tasks, even a lot of money doesn't do the job. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just a, a historical side note. This is uh, people actually did do this task manually 100 years back in a photogrammetry community where people were doing manual correlation to uh, extract height map profiles from aerial images. Uh, but that's, that's clearly not that scalable. Okay, um, so the question is what can we do? And I think that that should also maybe uh, set a point for discussion here in the group. I want to present six strategies here, um, but these are certainly not the only ones. This is just uh, some, some points of thought. Uh, and I'd like to hear your strategies as well on how to combat this problem. Okay, so um, the, uh, the first strategy is about specialized architectures, right? And uh, with specialized architecture, I mean um, basically a hard constraint on the problem. It's like a prior, but you put the prior into the network architecture, right? So you design a specific network architecture to do a job. So here are just a few examples. I, I just briefly highlight uh, a few examples for each of these um, uh, strategies. Um, so this is object detection results from a network that we've trained and that's not a network for regular perspective images as you can see but it's a network for working with omnidirectional images. So this is a 360 degree image from an action camera but these cameras are also important in autonomous driving. For instance if you want to do parking maneuvers you have a little fisheye camera at the side and the distortions are really extreme. So if you look at, so this is the, what is called the equidirect angular representation. If you look at the poles um, which are basically the uh, top and the bottom of the sphere where the data is projected, where the data lives on, you get these heavy distortions. And now if you move the camera just a tiny bit, these distortions uh, change a lot. 
right? So if you would train a CNN directly on this representation for object detection, um, that wouldn't work very well because the CNN would need to um, encode all these uh, distortions, this distortion invariance into its model and learn this from data, okay? Um, so you need a very high capacity network to do so and you need a lot of data to do so and you know, of course also the computational requirements. So what you can do instead is you can have, and this is where these results are obtained with, actually the these are warning boxes, right? They don't look like boxes but they are actually boxes just projected from the sphere back into the uh, equirectangular representation, that's why we are so deformed. Um, so what we do instead is basically um, we try to encode this deformation invariance directly into the convolution kernels by having a convolution kernel that doesn't operate on, on the perspective or the equirectangular representation but operates directly on the sphere, right? And there's various ways of doing it. We have chosen here a very simple approach which is just basically resampling at every stage of the network which allows us to encode any um, uh, object detector out there into a, a, a standard framework very easily. Um, here's a second example where now the task is not object detection but it's actually 3D reconstruction and not only 3D reconstruction but semantic 3D reconstruction where the task is to annotate every voxel in the scene, give them a set of images to annotate every voxel in the scene with either free space label or um, an occupied label that is any of the semantic classes like you know, building, tree, uh, pole, etc. Now there is a, a, a whole line of works on how to do this um, using uh, primal dual algorithms, the Chambol Pock algorithm. This is, uh, there is for instance a famous paper by uh, Christian Hähne um, which this work builds upon um, where we use wolf shapes to model these relationships. Now what we do here is basically we encode um, this primal dual optimizer that basically propagates information according to the interactions in 3D space at multiple uh, scales here in this case. Uh, this, this turned out to be quite important to get long distance propagation to embed this in a neural network. And the way you can embed this tractably in a neural network, of course, is uh, by inference unrolling. Um, so we unroll the inference here at multiple levels uh, um, in the image pyramid. We have a little front end, so this is just a CNN and this is just a CNN, so the front end takes the data, puts it into the 3D space, um, and the back end uh, then basically it, uh, decodes the output to the final representation that you want. So each part has a little contribution, but then inside here, we relax this algorithm and give it basically more parametric parameters, so we generalize it. And because it's end-to-end uh, -end trainable, we can op optimize all these parameters that are uh, looking at these little correlations of semantic class labels. Um, end-to-end uh, -end with the front-end and the back-end. Here's an uh, example. Um, so this is a, just a 2D toy example, obviously. You can see the ground truth on the left. Um, you see the input here on uh, the second column. Um, so you can see that we have uh, put a lot of noise onto the input here and also uh, completely removed some regions, which is the most difficult case, so the structural removal. Um, and uh, what happens if you use just a simple TVL1 regularizer, for instance, which finds just minimal surfaces, it will just, you know, uh, find a building like this one here um, that just cuts off where the occlusion uh, starts, right? But that's obviously not a realistic reconstruction. Um, so what we can do now with this unrolled inference that encodes these parameters of these local correlations, uh, we can encode, for instance, that a building should never float in the air and always be connected to ground. Everything learned from data. Um, and so uh, instead of this, uh, you know, we get a bit more plausible results. And uh, this also works in uh, 3D, so there's a couple of examples here. Um, as, a, as a nice little side effect also, um, we can do the whole thing in just uh, 50 iterations of inference instead of just doing, uh, uh, instead of doing uh, 2,700 iterations which the original algorithm requires to converge because the, or, uh, the original algorithm we started with is, is not modeling the environment uh, perfectly accurate. So we can actually optimize the hyperparameters of this algorithm, etc. To arrive at, at a similar solution or even better solution, this is actually a real hole, uh, much much faster. Um, okay, so this is uh, this is indoor. You can see this different semantic classes with the different colors here, um, and uh, yeah, well, this is different data sets. This also works. Uh, this was outdoor. This is also uh, this also works indoors, where it's maybe a bit more interesting with more semantic class labels. 
Okay, um, so strategy two. Um, we already talked about priors. This was hard constraints. Now I'll talk about soft constraints. We can, of course, also embed soft constraints. Here's just a little example. For instance, if we want to, you know, uh, based on li LiDAR point clouds, we want to detect vehicles, but not just detect them, but also infer their 3D shape. Um, then we have the problem that actually there's, there's not, uh, not really good ground truth for this because the laser scan is also sparse, right? So what we can do instead is we can take a CAD model database, for instance from ShapeNet, and we can train uh, an autoencoder using a standard reconstruction loss which encodes our prior knowledge then in the latent representation uh, space and in the decoder. And then we, we basically plug this decoder into an encoder-decoder architecture that is then trained using a maximum likely, likelihood loss to predict from the observations directly to the completed shapes. This is basically an amortized inference, right? So here we, we've, we've taken the, uh, um, the shape prior uh, as, as additional information. Okay, uh, strategy three is uh, self-supervision. We have already heard about this in uh, Stefan's talk. And it's actually the same problem. <laughs> so you have already seen this uh, um, slide, basically, um, which is actually from a different paper, stolen from a different paper. Um, so here the idea is if you want to estimate optical flow where we really don't have ground truth data in real world conditions, what we can do is we can take these frames, put them to a, through a continent, this is our optical flow predictor, um, and then warp the images according to the estimated flow into each other, and then um, put a loss function onto um, this uh, warped image as a photometric loss function. There's different uh, ways you can do that. That's basically a classical optical flow formulation now. Instead of having this as an energy, we have it as a loss function. We need a smoothness loss in addition to avoid uh, the aperture problem. And uh, yeah, we, we're also working on this. I, I will go quickly about this. This is just, you know, instead of using two frames, we use three or more frames here. So we have a whole um, a longer temporal sequence where we have uh, now an encoder for the past and the future flow and what this allows us is to basically always have um, like a temporal, uh, you know, have in temporal direction, we have always visibility, right? If we have ever a forward occlusion or we have a backward occlusion, but we can never have both because the, the current frame pixel is always visible, obviously, because this is what we see in the image. So we know that ever it can only be occluded in next frame or in the, in the previous frame, but not in both, unless we would have very thin structures. And so this allows us to get a little bit improved uh, performance uh, in, in terms of estimating optical flow, which we do jointly with occlusion estimation here as well. So I just want to show you some results here. So this is uh, here at the bottom. I'll stop the video here. You can see that you know, there is no, this is not fine-tuned with any supervised uh, data, no optical flow fields, ground truth provided here. Still we get quite uh, you know, decent optical flow performance as you can see. Okay, uh, strategy four, um, mixed reality. So we heard already about this one here. I really like it a lot and we, we started uh, uh, one little project on it. Um, this is the Kala simulator. Um, it's purely synthetic data. It's, it's quite realistic um, because it builds on the Unreal Engine and uh, you can develop uh, um, models for self-driving as, as we're trying to do here. But uh, one big problem with such models, of course, is that these assets needed to be created by um, you know, designers, and, and that's quite uh, expensive, right? So now you push the annotation cost to the cost of actually hiring designers that, that create these models for you, unless you have a capturing system that can just capture the real world for you. And uh, we, we don't have such a, cap a capturing system, neither for indoor nor outdoor yet. Um, so, but, but one thing which is particularly difficult about this problem is to actually model the background. And so we said, okay, well, if we're interested in autonomous driving, we don't care so much about the background, right? We, we get tons of realistic appearance just by, by moving around and, and capturing real images. But what we care about is like the local environment, in particular other dynamic objects, where we have a lot of 3D CAD models already available, which are quite realistic and which we can render uh, so that we can get augmented scenes. So what you can see here on the top left is the uh, real scene from the KD dataset. Um, on the top right, this is the virtual KD dataset. Uh, this is a dataset created by people from Xerox um, that actually tried to replicate the real KD dataset with virtual scenes by staging it. And you can see that you know, in terms of realism, there's, there's quite a large gap here. And this here is uh, the dataset that we generated by taking you know, um, 
uh, real backgrounds and augmenting it with synthetic objects, right? So this is the same image, just like synthetic objects augmented into it. And you can see using standard rendering techniques like bidirectional path tracing, you get pretty decent results if you account for the local sensor statistics like you know aberration and noise, uh, etc. Which actually turns out to be quite important. We use this for training CNNs. Um, for actually improving object detection performance uh, or instant segmentation performance. Right? Now here, there's still an expensive, slow rendering step involved using um, uh, this, this path tracer. Now you can go one step further and say, well, um, there's actually very fast renderers like OpenGL that are not realistic, but they give you a couple of uh, uh, modalities like normals, materials, mask, uh, and depth information. And now we are also building on, on some of Lutland's prior work. Um, we, we are working on uh, getting, um, you know, getting a neural network to actually predict what the uh, path tracer would give us. Right. So here is basically this is the, the, the synthetic image or the uh, augmented image from the from the Blender rendering, and this is basically the output of a, a neural network that actually takes this these properties, these intermediate layers, and then tries to predict um, the first one that you've seen. And it can capture actually quite some amazing um, quantities, like, you know, uh, the shadow looks quite realistic. And also you can see these reflections, which are not, not really part of the, of, the, uh, of the input modalities, but the network sees the whole image, so it can basically, in, in, in some, you know, realistic manner, augment, or, or, uh, yeah, augment the synthetic uh, object into the scene. Um, and it uh, can adapt to um, different, you know, different materials. Uh, we did some ablation studies here. So this is basically a, 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 a result where we uh, trained on cars, but then tested on monkey heads. Um, and you can see um, that you know here we have a pro material, here we have car paint, and we have a glass material. You know, it looks it looks relatively realistic. Now the advantage of this is that it's fully differentiable and there's also differentiable renderers that can give you these, these uh, properties that are used as input here to have an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, pipeline at some point. Okay, um, strategy five um, is label transfer. Um, so that's also something we've been working on and promising uh, the community for two years now, a data set that we're still working on, but we're releasing this year. Um, so here the idea is, instead of labeling in the 2D domain, for instance for semantic segmentation, we annotate the 3D domain. Um, and then we project this 3D information into the 2D image. So here in this case we have a 3D reconstruction. It's sparse and noisy, and the annotations are you know, very you know, coarse. Um, so it's a difficult problem to actually project this into the image. Um, but you can do this. Um, and uh, so here is just a little little video showing the, the annotation process. This is uh, one of the kitty sequences and uh, this is uh, the annotation process of a dynamic object. So you have a little like, kind of a video editor where you can put bounding boxes and interpolate between. So you get um, the, uh, bond, the 3D bounding box around um, the points that you want to annotate with a certain semantic or instance label. Um, and then we developed an algorithm that can take these labels and project them into the 2D image. So you get a result like this. Um, you can see it's not perfect here in the sky, for instance. We're still you know, also in, uh, in trying to improve performance, but we, we jointly optimize 2D and 3D space here. So we have, if we want to work with 3D data, we also have the 3D data here, and we have uh, at the same time 2D instant segmentations at very large scale, right? Because we need to annotate the 3D scene only once. We have seen it with, from many different viewpoints, so we can reproject this into many different viewpoints, and you get you know, something like this. Sorry, it's a bit fast. <laughs> Okay. And uh, finally, uh, a last uh, strategy might be model generalization. So just taking advantage, capitalizing on the capability of deep learning uh, in terms of generalizing. And this is something that we've done in terms of, um, you know, trying to uh, predict dense depth maps from sparse information. So this is, for instance, the scenario where you have a um, you know, a LiDAR scan projected into an image because the laser point cloud is, is not dense. Um, you have a sparse uh, projection here. This is heavily visually enhanced. The sparsity level in this case is actually 5%. Um, and this is a synthetic example. We have real ones as well here. Um, this is uh, just uh, for com comparisons. Um, so, 
Um, this is the ground truth. And what happens if you now run a regular confnet on this sparse uh, representation that will not work very well, even if you supply um, the visibility mask to it. Uh, and the reason is that, you know, locally the density changes and becomes much, much worse. You get a systematic bias if you now adapt from, from the global 5% like, density level to, let's say, 10%. So what we did is we developed a, a very simple extension to confnets, which is uh, invariant to the sparsity level, both locally and globally. Um, and so this allows us to get uh, quite good results at any sparsity level. And we can particularly also train at a different sparsity level that we test on. So we can train at 5% and test on 10%. So what this allows us then is to, for instance, you know, if we have, let's say, 5% uh, laser, uh, laser point data, we can drop out, right? We can remove half of it, so we have only 2.5%, and try to predict the remaining 2.5%, um, and then take this model in order to predict from the 5% to 100%, right? And that basically works quite well uh, for this particular uh, depth completion task. Okay, um, so these were my uh, six strategies, and uh, I hope we can use um, maybe a little bit of our remaining time for discussion on. Uh, I'd like to hear basically from you what are your strategies of dealing with, uh, you know, the shortage of data, or how can you train your models with, you know, um, sufficiently, uh, sufficiently, sufficiently how many data uh, points uh, so that you get the performance that you like. Thanks.